Welcome to Evening Prayer for Friday, October the 2nd. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. O Lord, how many are my foes. Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. Our New Testament reading tonight is from Matthew chapter 7. Judge not that you not be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce you will be judged, and with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Our Book of Concord reading tonight is from the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, Articles 7 and 8 in the Reader's Edition, beginning in paragraph 30. The adversaries also condemned the part of Article 7 in which we said that, for the true unity of the Church, it is enough to agree about the doctrine of the Gospel and the administration of the sacraments. It is not necessary that human traditions, that is, rites or ceremonies instituted by men, should be the same anywhere, everywhere. Here they distinguish between universal and particular rites. They approve our article if it is understood concerning particular rites. They do not approve it concerning universal rites. We do not completely understand what the adversaries mean. We are speaking of true spiritual unity. Without faith in the heart or righteousness of heart before God, such unity cannot exist. Similarity of human ceremonies, whether universal or particular, is not necessary. The righteousness of faith is not a righteousness bound to certain traditions. The righteousness of the law was bound to the Mosaic ceremonies, but righteousness of the heart is a matter that enlivens the heart. Human traditions, whether they are universal or particular, contribute nothing to this new life. Neither are the traditions effects of the Holy Spirit as our self-control, patience, the love of God, love of one's neighbor, and the works of love. The reasons why we presented this article were not small. Clearly, many foolish opinions about traditions had crept into the Church. Some thought that human traditions were necessary services for earning justification. Afterward, they argued how God came to be worshipped with such variety as though these observances were acts of worship, and not outward and political ordinances. Such ordinances have no connection with the righteousness of heart or the worship of God. These ordinances vary according to the circumstances for certain probable reasons, sometimes in one way and at other times in another. Likewise, some churches have excommunicated others because of such traditions as the observance of Easter, icons, and the like. 
So the ignorant have imagined that faith or the righteousness of the heart before God cannot exist without these ceremonies. Many foolish writings of the summists and of others exist on this matter. We believe that the true unity of the church is not injured by dissimilar ceremonies instituted by humans, just as the dissimilar length of the day and night does not injure the unity of the church. However, it is pleasing to us that, for the sake of peace, universal ceremonies are kept. We also willingly keep the order of the Mass in the churches, the Lord's Day, and on more famous festival days. With a very grateful mind, we include the beneficial and ancient ordinances, especially since they contain a discipline. This discipline is beneficial for educating and training the people and those who are ignorant, the young people. We are not discussing now whether it is helpful to keep them because of peace or bodily profit. We speak of something else. The question at hand is whether the observances of human traditions are acts of worship necessary for righteousness before God. This is the point to be judged in this controversy. When this is decided, it can be judged later whether it is necessary that human traditions should everywhere be the same for true unity of the Church. For if human traditions are not acts of worship necessary for righteousness before God, it follows that those not having the traditions received elsewhere can be righteous and the sons of God as well. For example, if the style of German clothing is not worship of God and necessary for righteousness before God, it follows that people can be righteous in God's sons and Christ's church, even though they use a costume that is not German but French. Paul clearly teaches this to the Colossians. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or Sabbath. These are but a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Likewise, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings? These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism. Colossians 2, 20-23. The meaning is this, righteousness of the heart is a spiritual matter, a matter of enlivening hearts. Clearly, human traditions do not enliven hearts and are not effects of the Holy Spirit. Such efforts are love for one's neighbor, self-control, and so on. They are not tools through which God moves hearts to believe, as are the divinely given word and sacrament. Rather, traditions are customs that have no connection to the heart. They perish with the using, and we must not believe that they are necessary for righteousness before God. To the same effect, Paul says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. But there is no need to cite many testimonies, for they are everywhere clear in the scriptures, and we have gathered many of them in the later articles of our confession. In this controversy, the point to be decided must be repeated, namely, whether human traditions are acts of worship necessary for righteousness before God. In due course, we will discuss this matter fully. The adversaries say that universal traditions should be observed because they were supposedly handed down by the apostles. What religious men they are! They wish that ceremonies received from the apostles be kept. Yet they do not wish the apostles' doctrine to be kept. They should judge these rites just as the apostles themselves judged them in their writings. For the apostles did not want us to believe that we are justified through such ceremonies, or that such ceremonies are necessary for righteousness before God. The apostles did not want to put such a burden upon consciences. They didn't want to place righteousness and sin in the observance of days, food, and the like. Yes, Paul calls such, uh, yes, Paul calls such opinions teachings of demons, 1 Timothy 4.1. Therefore, the apostles' will and advice should be taken from their writings. It is not enough to mention their example. The apostles observed certain days not because this observance was necessary for justification, but in order that the people might know at what time they should gather. They observed also certain other ceremonies and orders of lessons wherever they gathered. The people kept the customs of the fathers from their Jewish festivals and ceremonies. As is commonly the case, the apostles adapted to the history of the gospel certain things, although somewhat changed. Among these were the Passover and Pentecost. The apostles did this so that not only by teaching, but also through these examples, they might hand down to posterity the memory of the most important subjects. And we'll continue with that on Monday evening.
Now we join in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And as always on Fridays, our Friday prayer meditates on the Passion of Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, true God and true man, we thank you that you have redeemed us poor and condemned creatures, not by any of our works, merit, or worthiness, but by your holy suffering, death, and shedding of blood. O Lord, your suffering was great, your torment was heavy. We cannot comprehend how many your stripes, how deep your wounds, or the bitterness and painfulness of your death. How inexpressible is your love that reconciled us to your heavenly Father. In great fear of death, you sweat blood on the Mount of Olives, drops of blood that fell upon the earth, and there, abandoned by all your disciples, you willingly gave yourself into the hands of those who led you mercilessly, bound hard and cruel from one unjust judge to another. You were falsely accused and condemned, spit upon, scoffed at, and struck in the face with fists. For the sake of our misdeeds, you were hit, whipped, crowned with thorns, and treated wretchedly, like a worm and not a man. You were despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, so that even a heathen heart took pity and said, Behold the man. For the sake of our sin, you were counted a sinner and hung up between two evildoers as a curse. You were pierced in hands and feet with nails, and in your highest thirst, you were given vinegar and gall to drink. Finally, in great pain, you gave up your spirit so that you could pay our debt and we could be healed by your wounds. O Lord Jesus Christ, for this and all your other suffering and pain, we give you thanks and praise. We pray you, let your holy, bitter suffering and death not be lost on us, but grant that at all times this may be our comfort, and that we may boast in it, and that as we ponder it, all evil desire in us may be snuffed out and subdued, and all virtue may be implanted and increased, so that we, having died to sin, may live in righteousness, following the example you have left us, walking in your footsteps, enduring evil with patience, and suffering injustice with a good conscience. Amen. Merciful God, in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, you give good gifts to your children, the gifts of forgiveness, life, and salvation. Teach us to give the gift of love and mercy to our neighbors, so that we may do unto others as we wish them to do unto us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.